Good morning, it's seven o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. Top stories today, plans to ease the pressure on the pumps. Downing Street is expected to allow a temporary visa scheme for foreign HGV drivers to stop the shortage. I'm live outside a petrol station in West London where they're queuing to get in, despite assurances that there's no shortage of fuel. Labour pain, Sir Keir Starmer backtracks on plans to rewrite the party rulebook ahead of this weekend's conference. We'll talk to his deputy at half past. Remembering Sabina Nessa, hundreds attend a vigil for the school teacher murdered on her way to a pub in South East London. More towns evacuated and flights cancelled as volcanic eruptions intensify on La Palma. This is the live view from the volcano right now as it spews lava for a sixth day. Bond is back. Fans prepare to be shaken and stirred by Daniel Craig's final appearance as 007. I've never regretted it. It's been tough, but it's always, 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 always been interesting. It's always been creatively satisfying. In the sport with Jackie, it's advantage to the USA as they take on Europe in the Ryder Cup golf match in Wisconsin. The weather today, more warm sunny spells this weekend, but it's turning cooler next week. And at quarter two, we'll take through the papers with the broadcasters Gemma Forte and Thomas Copeland. Morning to you. The government is considering temporary measures to tackle the shortage of HGV drivers, which is causing panic at petrol pumps and empty shelves around the country. Reports suggest the Prime Minister is poised to introduce a temporary easing of visa rules to allow more foreign drivers into the UK. It comes as queues were seen stretching from petrol station forecourts up and down the country yesterday as concerns over a fuel shortage spread. Well, Emma Birchley is outside a petrol station in West London for us now, where it seems, Emma, the queues are continuing today. Yes, there have been queues here actually throughout the night, we know, and they're queuing on the A4 here at the other ex entrance as well. But actually, in the last 10 minutes or so, uh, one of the staff members has come out and said no more petrol. So there's diesel, but no more petrol here. And actually... Driving in this morning, passing four petrol stations, I passed two where every single pump had been covered over because they'd simply uh, run out of petrol. And that's why ministers met yesterday uh, to discuss what was going to happen. Um, they're talking about uh, contingency plans, so short-term visas. It's been, been reported that may be as many as 5,000. Part of the problem is the pandemic. People haven't been able to take HGV tests, um, but also um, people haven't been able to come to work. And then there's Brexit. We know that 14,000 HGV drivers from the EU left the UK in the year to June 2020. So that all adds up. Let's have a little look round here. If you come and have a look. Now, there are fewer vehicles than there were, because if you look here at these pumps, these were all in action. It looks like there may still be uh, V-Power fuel, but actually most of the pumps all around have started being covered up. Uh, they are no longer in action. And it's that kind of picture we're seeing uh, across the country. And earlier, just a few minutes ago, actually, I was speaking to some people as they queued up here who voiced their intense frustration about what's happening. It's stupidity that we're all queuing up. But this is my job. So I have to have diesel. That's it. I'm in here for my work. I never know where it's going. So I've got to have diesel. Everybody else, one person tells someone there's queues, so they go and, and do it, and so on and so forth. It's interesting. You're lucky you need diesel, because they've just been saying no, uh, no petrol, no petrol, just yeah. diesel. Yeah, that's, that's fine by me, because I've been working all night, and... Lots of stations have got cars down to the next big junction. So I don't know why they're doing it. If they need it, fine. 
I need mine. But they're just feeling to say I've got a full tank. Yeah, so that was Oswald. He's a taxi driver. He obviously really needs his fuel. But I'm, I've seen people filling up little petrol cans here, maybe for their lawnmower. But you imagine it's just in case they end up in a situation where there simply isn't any fuel left. But of course, the shortage isn't just fuel uh, lorry drivers. It's also for food deliveries. And we've been hearing concerns about the impact that might have. We've already seen shortages, but particularly with uh, Christmas, just a few months away, the British Retail Consortium says this needs to be sorted swiftly if we're not going to find ourselves facing some significant shortages over Christmas. Now, the government says that HGV tests are happening at a faster pace. There are more people carrying out those examinations. So with the temporary visas, it should be in theory that this is eased, but certainly no easing of the people queuing up to make sure they get some petrol. OK, Emma, thank you. Now, the Labour Party conference starts in Brighton today, but already Sir Keir Starmer has been forced to retreat over his attempt to rewrite the party's rulebook. He's had to put reforms on hold after a backlash from unions and party activists. Our chief political correspondent, John Craig, reports from Brighton. The sun may have shone in Brighton, but the mood on the opening day of Labour's conference is anything but sunny. Sakir Starmer suffered humiliation on the eve of conference when in meetings behind closed doors he was forced to put his plans for party reforms on hold after opposition from trade unions and left-wingers. Sakir wants to scrap the one-member-one-vote system on which he and Jeremy Corbyn were elected leader and return to an electoral college where MPs, unions and activists each have a third of the votes. His retreat has raised new questions about his leadership. This was a golden opportunity, you know, for Keir to get up there and speak to the people in this country and, and tell them what the Labour Party stands for, tell them what we want in terms of solutions. I think that it's an own goal, it'll be a missed opportunity and people will be wondering why we're navel-gazing and talking about rule changes. After her barnstorming performance standing in for Sakir at Prime Minister's Questions this week, Deputy Leader Angela Rayner opens the conference this afternoon with a speech pledging a new deal for working people. But policy pledges are in danger of being overshadowed. Is it make or break for you? It's not a relaunch uh, by any shape or means. This is a chance, I think, for um, me to set out what the future looks uh, like um, and Again, one of the things I've taken away from um, all the various discussions I've had over the, uh, the course of this summer is people desperately want change. But the pressure on Sir Keir has now increased. The Labour leader may deny that this is a make-or-break conference for him and his leadership, but there's no doubt it's absolutely crucial as Labour attempts to mount a fight back against Boris Johnson and the Conservatives at a time when the government is facing all sorts of problems. But first, Sir Keir has to try to salvage his party reforms and rebuild his battered reputation. John Craig, Sky News, Brighton. Hundreds of people gathered in south-east London last night for a vigil in memory of the murdered primary school teacher Sabina Nessa. The 28-year-old was attacked last Friday as she walked to meet a friend at a pub just five minutes from her home. Her sister attended the vigil and told crowds that her world had been shattered. A 12-year-old boy has died after being seriously injured at an indoor ski centre. Officers were called to the snow dome in Tamworth yesterday to report that a child had been hurt. The boy died a short while later. A man was also injured. Prince Andrew's lawyers have accepted that he's been served with a sexual assault lawsuit by Virginia Gaffray. She claims the Duke of York sexually assaulted her on three occasions when she was a teenager, two of which, she says, occurred at the homes of convicted sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. Prince Andrew has always denied the allegations against him. A jury is yet to reach a verdict in the R. Kelly sex trafficking trial. They'll resume deliberations on Monday. 
The R&B star is accused of running a Chicago-based trafficking ring with accusations of sexual and physical abuse dating back decades. A top boss at the Chinese tech giant Huawei has left Canada for the first time in almost three years after being detained on bank fraud charges. Meng Wanzhou, Huawei's chief financial officer, has been allowed to return to China after reaching an agreement with US prosecutors. In exchange, Beijing has released two Canadian nationals detained since 2018. It's a significant breakthrough in what was becoming an increasingly heated point of tension between Beijing and Washington. Now, it's been six days since the eruption of a volcano in the Canary Islands, but explosions are intensifying once again, as you can see from these live pictures of Cumbre Vieja behind me. Now, authorities have stepped up efforts to evacuate more people, but they're being hampered by cancelled flights caused by giant ash clouds. Ashna Huranag has the latest from La Palma. For a tiny island, this is some disaster. It descends, smouldering and spewing on La Palma. Its unpredictable actions have led to predictable reactions. Those boarding a fully booked ferry to neighboring Tenerife are eager to get out. I came here from another island because I have family here and I tried to help them because part of my family have lost everything. My uncle lost his house and a lot of friends and yeah, it's very sad, very sad. It's horrible. Just 15 minutes till departure, but they're still trying their luck for tickets. Where do they go now when hotel rooms are scarce too? Many of them are housing the now homeless that number will rise too, with three more towns being evacuated as the volcano signals further distress. Sometimes gas that's building up as big bubbles is getting close to the surface and essentially erupting in, in a violent explosion. And they can, they can produce shock waves. So the shock wave itself is, is essentially a very fast moving, often moving faster than ambient sound, a change in pressure, um, density and velocity as a wave coming out from those explosions. It is no wonder why the mood has changed. The thick cloud continues to pulse from the volcano, filling the skies above the island. Public health advice has changed too. Wear your mask outside, close your windows, and don't go out unless necessary. Hundreds of buildings have been engulfed. This house, the anomaly, stands freakishly untouched. The Spanish Prime Minister is optimistic of the island's recovery. We are all working together. What we want is to solve both the immediate problems of the people affected and the ones that will emerge later. We'll reconstruct La Palma and make this an opportunity to relaunch the island. It may be considered premature to some. This element of Mother Nature will change the landscape forever. It may not have taken any lives, but it's burning everything in between. Ashna Harinag, Sky News, on La Palma. Now, Germans head to the polls tomorrow to decide who's going to replace Angela Merkel as her time as Chancellor comes to an end after 16 years. Let's talk to Oliver Moody, Berlin correspondent for The Times. Good to see you this morning. I mean, it, the polls seem very, very tight at the moment. I mean, a coalition's inevitable, is it? Good morning. Um, it is, as Sir Alex Ferguson used to say, squeaky bum time. Um, the polls are getting exceedingly tight and Angela Merkel's conservative CDU-CSU alliance has pulled to um, one or two percentage points uh, behind the Social Democrats. Um, it's hard to think of a closer election in Germany's modern history this close to polling day. And um, yes, there have Germany's been ruled by coalitions ever since um, 1949, and um, this time we're very likely to end up with a three or even four-party coalition. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not that long ago that the, the Greens were actually leading the polls. Now, they're, they're not at the moment, but, I mean, clearly they're making significant inroads. And, and does that mean that the whole environment agenda is more and more important to the German population? That's a very interesting question. The polls suggest that particularly 
following the drought of 2018 and the extreme flooding in the Rhineland um, in July this year, the environment has um, shot up to the top of the political agenda. But there's a lot of disagreement on um, what kind of sacrifices the German public is prepared to make and um, whether the best way to decarbonize is through restricting things, as the Green Party tends to favor, or by um, sort of stimulating the market to develop new uh, carbon cutting technologies as the CDU and um, the, the sort of more economically liberal parties tend to go for. So the environment is a huge issue in this election, but that doesn't necessarily favor uh, the Green Party. Okay, well, that's interesting. Look, in, in, in because this is tight, um, are we, whoever becomes Chancellor after Angela Merkel, and obviously there are a few names on the list now with this being so close, but does are, are we likely to see any significant change in, in direction? Absolutely not, frankly. Um, the contest uh, between Armin Laschet, the leader of the CDU, and Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor candidate from the Social Democrats, has been very much a competition to look like Angela Merkel. They've been emulating her gestures, they've been borrowing her phrases, and um, the policy platforms that they put forward have a few differences on um, sort of fiscal policy and taxation, but otherwise they look very much like continuity from the Merkel era, and both sides are trying not to frighten the horses and to, to make it clear that Merkel's legacy will be safe in their hands. I mean, is there a sense that Armin Laschet has perhaps not resonating with voters in the, in the same way as, as perhaps uh, Mr Schultz? That's putting it mildly. Um, there was a poll released yesterday where German voters were asked who they would pick as their chancellor if they could, and um, Laschet actually came fourth behind um, not just the SPD but the Greens and the economically liberal Free Democrats. Um, his favourability ratings are behind Schultz by a long shot on almost every single conceivable point. Um, he's spectacularly unpopular. It's hard to, hard to think of a more unpopular candidate than the CDU since um, it was founded in 1949. OK, well, look, we shall watch with interest tomorrow. Oliver, good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, after near endless delays, many feared they'd never get to see the latest Bond film, but they'll never say never again because it's finally in cinemas this coming Thursday. And for your eyes only, oh, our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer has spoken to Daniel Craig and Bond producer Barbara Broccoli. Fans have needed a stiff martini waiting for Daniel Craig's much delayed final outing as Bond. But now it's here. Real life got in the way and delayed this coming out. How, how has that process been? We had to kind of had to be kind of like, well, there's nothing we could do. Thankfully, um, both MGM and Universal held their nerve, and we didn't see this slip into a streaming service. And we got here, and we're going to actually get it into the cinemas, which is just a joyous thing. We know that Amazon uh, are buying MGM. Does that mean that we might see a sort of spin-off TV show? Well, I don't think so. We have not wanted to do spin-offs, so I think that's our position. They certainly have told us that, um, that the films will, will be theatrical films in the future, and we'll see what happens. There's something I need to tell you. I bet there is. Are you pleased that you did say yes to the job? I've never regretted it. It's been... Tough, but it's always, 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 always been interesting. It's always been creatively satisfying. You were quite open from the start that one of the worst parts has been the, the level of press intrusion that you've had. Mm. From where, where we were 15 years ago, we've had things like the Leveson Inquiry and uh, the newspapers saying that they will adhere to certain codes of conduct. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, do you think anything's changed or is it the nature of the beast of having this role? I'll be perfectly honest, I couldn't deal with it, but, but it's, it is... The, it is part of the nature of the beast and you have to sort of accept it. I try and keep a very private life, so that, uh, that's my sort of... that's my sort of line in the sand, I suppose. Walking away from 007 hasn't been as easy for the Bond star as newspapers might have made out. This was his last day on set. I've got up every morning and I've had the chance to work um, with you guys, and that has been one of the greatest honours of my life. Are you quite excited at the thought of putting your feet up, having a bacon sandwich? 
I'd do that anyway. I bust my ankle on this one. How many weeks in? Six weeks in, Something maybe. Like yeah. That, yeah. Which is sort of like, eh, well, there you go. <laughs> At the end of Spectre, that was one of the reasons I thought I had to stop because I just thought I was not physically able to do it anymore. The next James Bond, then, is it, is it in your head or is it a lot more fluid? Oh, God, God, it's not in my head at all. As I say, I'm in denial. I don't want to think about it, and I'm not going to think about it. As far as I'm concerned, Daniel Craig is James Bond. End of story. How do you both hope that people will remember the Daniel Craig Bond? That we took it somewhere, that we, that we did something with it that, 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 was, that it had some meaning. When people think of them fondly in the future, that's just all gravy, you know? Thank you so much. Thank you. I can't wait. I cannot wait. Uh, let's have a look at the weather for you. And it has been uh, a warm and dry month, exceptionally so, but it's going to turn cooler and unsettled next week. Most places having a mild and cloudy start, bit of drizzle, few fog patches, going to be windier and wetter across the far north of Scotland. Now, the skies will brighten to leave a largely fine and dry day. Best of the warm sunshine for East Wales, the Midlands, northeast Scotland. It will be sunnier across southern England a little bit later on. Now, the Labour Party conference begins later on today by the seaside, but it's already been a rocky start for the leader, Sir Keir Starmer, who's backed down on his voting reform proposals after criticism from within the party. Well, let's talk to the deputy leader, Angela Rayner, who joins me now. It's good to see you this morning. Look, why has Sir Keir capitulated on this? Morning. Well, what Keir set out was a consultation about how we can look at our party and make sure that we're a party that's looking to government. And, you know, I've never known a conference yet where we haven't had a little bit of argy-bargy, certainly at the start, about where we see the direction of the party going. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of that debate going into conference, and that's the right thing to do. So I don't really see it as, you know, Keir backing down. Keir said that he wanted to have a consultation. It was right that he set the tone for that, and it's right that, you know, we're taking the issues forward that matter to people and that, you know, I'm talking about a new deal for working people. I'll be setting out that in my conference speech later this afternoon and that's what I want to do is get on the topic of how we improve people's lives in this country. But, it, I mean, he's, he, he set out a, a 10,000 word essay, didn't he, on the reforms he, he wanted to bring in. That's what we were told. That's all gone by the by now, which, I mean, leaves people, I mean, understandably so, saying, well, what does this tell us about his leadership if he can't even push through what he thinks is essential for the future of the party? Well, I can tell you didn't read his essay because he didn't mention a rule change once in no, those no, 10,000 words. Certainly he was got, actually setting I, I out a programme. I haven't got program. time to read 10,000 <laughs> words at the minute. <laughs> Well, well, I can tell you, I can give you the summary, the executive summary was he was setting out a programme which is about how we can focus on, you know, things have got very difficult for people in this country and it's because of the, the failed promises of the Conservative government and it's about the alternative to that, which is about giving people secure work, um, you know, providing good public services, about looking after people's mental well-being as well as their physical well-being, about rebuilding the country that looks at working people and the people that create wealth and therefore gives them more of that share so stops the zero hour contracts stops insecure work provides a minimum floor so that people actually go to work to live rather than live for work and that's the important differential is that we're on the side of working people whereas the conservatives have shown themselves to be taxing them now cutting universal credit freezing the personal allowance and all the while living you know living costs are going up because of the government's failures on things like energy and the government's failures on being able to provide you know the skilled HGV drivers so that we've got those supplies of food and fuel and you know people have started to panic buy fuel and I would urge people not to do that um, because that will only make the situation worse but this is of the government's own doing and their failures. I mean it's fair to say the government is is facing big problems at the minute and yet you know the, let's be fair the Labour Party has been pretty silent on these issues. I mean, very few people watching today are going to download and try to read 14,000 words from Sir Keir Starmer to see what, what Labour's position is on that. 
Well, all I can say is that if you didn't watch PMQs on Wednesday, then get it on catch up because I gave the government what for on these issues. You know, our shadow chancellor wrote as the chair of the select committee warning them about the fact that they'd lost the facilities for our gas storage, which has had a significant impact on the situation we face now. These are problems that the government has faced for a while. They knew it was coming and have failed to respond. It's a theme that we have with this government. They constantly do things at the last minute, at the last possible point, and create the crisis in the first place. So, you know, we have been urging the government to look at these issues, but, you know, once again, Boris Johnson and his government have basically decided to have a laissez-faire attitude and hope that things will just fix itself. Well, it hasn't fixed itself, and their policies have come home to roost for the British public. Well, this is a chance, as Sakia said in a, in a Sky News interview, this is a chance to set out what the future looks like. Well, the future looks like the Labour Party being led by someone who is at least, I mean, you're going to say wrongly, but, but perceived by many now as being pretty weak. I don't think the public see Keir as weak. Actually, what they see is somebody who's very serious, who's very forensic, and who tackles the government in a very constructive way. Now, some people like the bombastic way in which I uh, tackle the government. I'm more of a John Prescott type figure, and you know that, that's just my style. Keir has a different style, but that doesn't mean to say that he's not incredibly passionate and forensic, and has managed to, you know, many times Keir has raised the issues of concern and he's been proven right but he doesn't do the punch and judy type of theatrical politics he does the serious these are serious issues facing our country child poverty is record high people are waiting for cancer treatment and have been denied it you know we have a crisis now on our forecourts we have problems with fuel and energy and we have cuts that have impacted on working families and Keir is raising those issues and I think that's right to do that this conference is about also putting forward what we would do differently and what our priorities are. Yeah, but if you're going to win the next election, whenever that is, you know, 23 or, or 24, you've got to have someone who's going to appeal to the electorate. And there are questions around that now. Whereas, I mean, you said in an interview just the other day you wouldn't turn down the opportunity to be party leader, which in itself is a controversial thing to say. Well, no, you see, the problem is, is that everybody fixates on would you ever want to be party leader? And I said it's been an absolute honour and a privilege, first of all, to be elected as a member of parliament for Ashton Underline and the people that elected me there, but also a great privilege to be elected the deputy leader of the Labour Party that gave me so many opportunities in the last Labour government that has got me to where I am today. So I take that as an absolute honour to do it. And I think a lot of the times, especially when women get asked this question, we say, oh, no, no, that's not what we want and it makes us look like you know we're not ambitious I want every woman in this country to be ambitious but my ambition and I'm very clear on this is to get Keir Starmer into number 10 because this country cannot face more of conservative broken promises and lies and for me to be deputy prime minister by Keir Starmer's side making the difference because I was a home carer I've done a manual job I've you know I've had to worry about my heating bills and looking after my children and that is what many people in this country face today and they want to see us coming up with the solutions and I'm passionate about making sure that they see that both myself and Keir are going to go into government and make their lives better and enable them to be more fulfilled at work and to have those minimum standards that mean they don't have to worry about whether they're going to have a shift next week or whether they're going to have to choose between heating or eating. Angela Lorena, it's good to talk to you, thank you. Now, more than 60,000 fans will be at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium tonight as Anthony Joshua puts his heavyweight world titles on the line against mandatory challenger Alexander Usyk. Jackie caught up with her relaxed AJ earlier this week and started by asking what sort of night he's expecting. Saturday night, I'm expecting to come out, walk through that tunnel. 60,000 people swing, uh, singing Sweet Caroline. Uh, Usyk waiting in the ring. People singing his name, people singing my name. You know, the intro, Michael Buffer announcing, let's get ready to rumble. Fans going crazy, the first bell goes. It's such a beautiful sound. It's, uh, in the gym, it's normally a buzzer. If you know boxing, it's normally like a little buzzer that goes off in the gym. But that, that bell sound, ding, ding, ding. 
Round one is underway. Um, the lights are just shining on that ring. Everything around you is like black. It's dark. But it, the lights just shine on that ring, and it's like it's a phenomenal feeling. A really phenomenal feeling. Do you think people don't always give you credit for your boxing ability, given what you've achieved? Well, I, I never look at it like that. You know, well, look, there's 60,000 people coming out, so they must like something about what I'm doing. But I don't want to be, like, searching for so much love. I just hope people appreciate boxing as a whole, the whole undercard, me. It's going to be a good night of boxing. Um, underrated, overrated, valued. At least certain people value. I think let's not focus on the negative about the people that don't value what I do. I like to focus on people that do value what I do. How do you deal with fight night itself? You know, obviously there's pressure, but you always look relaxed. But when you wake up in the morning, do you have butterflies? Are you excited? So you, you start with visualization from training camp, putting yourself in that scenario mentally. So when you kind of wake up, look, no matter how you feel, no matter how you feel, tired, achy. Um, I, I go in, I know sparring isn't the opponent, but there's times when I've got to go in and I've got four or five guys waiting to spar me and I may not feel 100%, but the, the ultimate thing is I get out the other end. I always perform, I go there, and on fight night, your adrenaline, whether you've got a headache, you've got a bad foot, a bad hand, whatever it may be, uh, the environment just overtakes you and makes you feel at ease. Like You just feel like... There's nothing else that matters in the world right now except for this event that's going on. And to have the fans back, finally, what does that mean? For me, it's, it just it makes me humble because in a way that I just got to dedicate myself to the craft so I can go out there and perform for uh, all these fans that come out. I don't take it for granted. It's not like I've ticked that box, like forget it now, I'm happy, I've done what I've had to do. Um, I fought in front of X amount of people. I actually look at it and I'm like, boy, I need to make sure I practice and I work hard because I want to give these guys value, you know what I mean? So I, that's how I pay them back. Did you know that reducing pollution outside of school can help stop toxic air getting trapped in our classrooms? It will be a mild and cloudy start with spots of drizzle and some fog patches. The skies will brighten to leave a largely dry and warm day. The best of the sunshine for East Wales, the Midlands and North East Scotland. Cloudier towards the northwest with patchy light rain and windier here too. Taking a look at the daily air quality index where levels of air pollution are bandied from 1 being low to 10 being very high, air pollution levels are expected to remain low today despite the light winds across the south. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. Well, time for the papers once again with Gemma Forte and Thomas Copeland. Good to see you. Let's kick straight off with The Guardian, Gemma. Um, a make-or-break conference for Sakia Starmer, not according to Angela Rayner. No, not according to Angela Rayner, but I think... I think it probably is, let's be honest. So I'm someone that is just desperate for the opposition to get it together at this stage. I know it's been difficult for Starmer from the point of view that he's been in opposition during a global pandemic. It is uh, not so easy to be criticising a government at a time when everybody needs you to come together. That said, there's been open goal after open goal, and I feel like Labour have missed it. Um, every time. Every time you turn around and you're like, OK, where's the opposition? They're arguing amongst themselves and that has to end. So this is his opportunity now to tell everybody what it is he wants to do. Now, typically, again, this has been maybe overshadowed by the fact that one of the things he wants to do is put a last minute bid through to push how you elect leaders. leaders. And I think that needs to be put to one side. He's also written this big opus, this big sort of manual, if you like, his philosophy, his um, his thought process behind what he wants to do. He's been criticised for that. That I don't get, because we have a prime minister who arguably doesn't put any thought behind anything and just blusters through in a very... Um, uh, sort of knee-jerk way. Um, so I do think we need government to be looking forward and strategizing and doing the dull stuff uh, to an extent. 
but we do also need some bite-sized slogans to an extent. That's what we're up against. The Conservative Party is so good at that. And the electorate need to know, OK, this is what they stand for. This is what they're going to do. And I think if he doesn't do that, you look at Angela Rayner and she has a vivaciousness and she has a ferocity that perhaps he doesn't have and that might cut through in a better way. Mm, well, let's have a look at Angela Rayner in a bit more detail. Thomas, she's apart from talking to us, which obviously was top of her list, she's done an interview with The Times. Yeah, that's right. The, her second favourite interviewer, I'm sure, Stephen. Um, if if Starmer's conference speech doesn't go well, the good news, I suppose, for Angela Rayner, she's waiting in the rings after a barnstormer of a uh, of a PMQs earlier in the week against Dominic Raab. She's featured here in The Times uh, in an interview that is well worth a read. Certainly, you'll come away with it maybe appreciating a lot more about your own childhood. The overriding sense you get is just the scale of the challenges that she faced as a young person, council estate in Stockport, uh, care for her bipolar mother, pregnant at 15, left school at 16, uh, thrown out of uh, her home by her father. I mean, to be a kind of fully functioning member of society, uh, that's impressive enough, not to mention deputy leader of the Labour Party, and to have, as the as the interview points out, a, a cocktail named after you in the House of Commons. And the most profound part, I actually think, is she talks uh, very powerfully about this the sense of emotional poverty and how that's distinct from any sort of financial poverty and the effect that that's had on her to this day. I think, you know, there are definitely people who might read it who would take a second look at, at Angela Rayner, perhaps, especially, you know, um, under the circumstances that Keir Starmer, the area in which he's found himself most, most difficult to communicate with the public, is certainly the policy, and I, I kind of agree with what Gemma's saying there, but also that emotional connection hasn't really been made. He mainly went on Piers Morgan's life stories earlier on in the year, attempting to make those kind of connections. And he has a very powerful story as well, but it just hasn't, you know, hasn't seemed to cut through in the same way. Politically, Angela Rayner has shown herself to be extraordinarily astute. She's sort of negotiated her way out of a demotion after that Hartlepool by-election into a promotion. Um, I wonder, you know, there will certainly be, maybe she has a team or supporters or people behind her might be whispering in her ear around springtime. I think if Keir Starmer hasn't started to dramatically turn things around by that stage, that would be the time when she makes those moves. I mean, I watched that interview with her. You, you, you conducted just there, Stephen, and obviously she's got all the right answers when it comes to, 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 to putting her support behind Keir Starmer. At this stage, um, you know, give it six months, will things be a little bit different? Mm. It's interesting. I mean, she certainly does have that appeal of being a, a real person, if you like, someone we, you know, that is more relatable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's having empathy, and I think that's what's been lacking in politics for a long time. I think, you know, when it was in, during the pandemic, when there was the feeding hungry children issue, and it just seemed in, unfathomable to most normal people that that wasn't being looked after. Um, so, yes, it would be nice to have politicians who understand what it is like to worry about their bills rather than uh, the current crop. Uh, I think the, you know, the other thing with... Oh, please, go yeah. on, Thomas. No, I was just going to say, it strikes me that Rayner's not afraid to, to kind of make a bold stand on things. I, I read Keir Starmer's, or I read a good part of St St Keir Starmer's uh, opus it was 35 pages long, 14,000 words. Uh, the problem is that I could I couldn't disagree with it or think of a single person who could possibly disagree with it. You know, uh, the, the the problem with um, you know you always know when something's a bit of a, a political platitude when when nobody could possibly take the opposite opinion. I wonder if if Rayner isn't as afraid to to take a stand, perhaps as afraid to decide who her voters are going to be. That's a problem that Keir Starmer has to deal with over the next number of of months and years. Who are his voters? Because because maintaining the kind of voter coalition that he's currently trying to balance is uh, probably nigh on impossible. He's decided who he needs to go for and who he needs to drop. I wonder if Raider might be a little bit more cutthroat there. Mm. Mm. Uh, interesting. Uh, let, let's, let's move on to the Express, should we? Um, the vigil we saw last night uh, for Sabina. I mean, huge vigil, actually, Gemma. Yes, and unsurprisingly, it's absolutely tragic. She had her whole life ahead of her and watching her parents, her family speak, her sister, it's horrendous, absolutely horrendous. You know, she was a daughter, a, a sister, a teacher to a year one class of primary school children. And I have to say, how do you break it to them what has happened here? You know, when you're in year one, if I can remember that far back, 
you love your teacher desperately. So it's it's tragic on all front. And of course, it follows the death of Sarah Everard. And we have to do something about male violence. It is not acceptable, of course. And it's tragic. And I know that Everybody there lighting a candle and uh, expressing their feeling on social media. You know, there is this huge outpouring, but how do we solve it? What do we do? And it is another issue that has to be addressed sooner rather than later so that no more young women lose their lives when all they're doing is walking home. That's it. No, it's impossible to argue with that. Uh, let's... Uh, Thomas, can we have a look at, at the mail, please? And, and Margaret Keenan, the first person in the world, I think, to get a, to get a, a Pfizer jab, has now had her booster. Yeah, that's right. I'm from Fermanagh. I just had to find that Northern Irish connection. We managed to wriggle our way in everywhere. Yeah, so Margaret Keenan's 91 grandmother has now got her booster jab. So she was the first person outside of clinical trials in the world to receive her initial jab way back. I think it was last December or so. She's been in for her booster jabs. This week, I think 35,000, 350,000, excuse me, 350,000 people have had their third booster jab. So I, 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 I'm... I'm Quizzical, though, because uh, it's going to be really important for the government, really important for the NHS to ensure that these booster jabs continue through the winter. I haven't heard nearly as much about it as my concern. I mean, it's been difficult enough making sure that that everybody is vaccinated, especially with some of those younger cohorts, um, the likes of kind of my age group. It's been more difficult to get, uh, the, you know, the vaccinations into those age groups. We'll need to ensure that the same kind of level of intensity is the word excitement, right? Novelty, that public push advert advertising is maintained getting the booster jabs into the winter because it might well be the case that COVID is like a number of other vaccines in that actually, you know, it's kind of a three shot vaccine. Maybe a better way to describe a booster is kind of your third shot. And I know there's some disagreement about that across different sides of the Atlantic, what way that should be phrased. The reality is, though, you know, it is in the public interest if people can get that third booster shot. Let's try to keep up that sense of intensity, whether it is, you know, getting pop up vans here, there and everywhere, free ice creams, free donuts, whatever it is. Let's try to make sure that, you know, we maintain the same level of excitement about getting your third shot as the first two, because yeah. that's a really effective way to make sure we don't have to bother with any restrictions, further lockdowns into the winter. You I'll know, get in there, I'll, get your I'll, be, I'll be queuing up for my because I'm entitled to one, thankfully. Uh, we'll just finish off. We've got about 30 seconds, Gemma. To the news which has made me smile of the last set. Thank heavens that Russell T. Davis is coming back to save Doctor Who. He is indeed. He was there um, in charge of the BBC's flagship science fiction show back when it was Christopher Eccleston in 2005, then when it was David Tennant. Um, and he is back. He's going to be handed back the baton. Obviously, in, well, in my opinion, he's a genius. Anybody who saw It's a Sin recently, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you didn't watch it, the writing is perfect. So it'll be fascinating to see what he comes up with. Yes, and fascinating to see who he brings in as the new Doctor. Cannot wait till that all happens. Lovely.